I love magic items. I love picking them out from the book. I love designing them myself. I love the look on my players' faces when they get a new exciting one. And I also love to get one myself on the rare occasions that I get to be a player. What I don't love is how the actual buying and selling and trading magic items is handled in 5e, or better said, how it is not handled as we're getting nearly no rules or guidelines for actually buying and selling magic items. So that's what I'll be covering in this mini-series, starting with how you're determining the value of magic items in 5e Dungeons and Dragons. All right, so my name is J.A. Veller. In short, I think there's two main issues with trading magic items in 5e. The first has to do with the value of the magic items, which is in 5e tied to an item's rarity, and which this video will go into more detail with. And then there's the actual act of going into a shop, trading magic items. How does uh, such a shop run? Who runs it? There's a lot of work involved with actually setting up the trade of magical items because the rules provide so little guidance. And that actually brings us to today's sponsor, which is us, Eventure Games. This issue of how to trade magic items in 5e actually annoyed us so much that we decided to write a whole book about it, which includes guidelines for trading, sample price list, whole merchants you can plug into your game, and of course, a lot of new magic items that you can give to your players or have them bargain for in one of the shops. If you sign up to the mailing list, there'll be a link to that in the description below. You can get a free sample of the book today and you'll also be notified on launch so you can take advantage of early bird special and launch day offers. All right, but this video isn't just an ad for Wanderer's Guide to Merchants and Magic. We are actually going to take a closer look at how you can price magic items. One of the biggest issues with dealing with magic items in 5e has to do with determining the item's actual value. The Dungeon Master's Guide specifically tells us that an item's rarity is an indicator of how powerful it is and also of how valuable it is. While I like the simplicity of the system, there are some issues with it that I think it pays for the DM to be aware of if you want your player characters to be able to buy and sell magic items. First, there's using rarity to determine value. Now, I didn't major in economics, but I had a course or two, and I can remember that supply, that would be rarity of an item, is only at most half of the equation for determining an object's value. The other half, or the other major half, is of course demand. You can have a very rare object, but if no one wants that object, the value of the object will still be lower than something that is more common, but also more coveted. The way 5e sets it up is that rarity is supposed to encapsulate both and actually tell us both the supply and the demand of a magic item. And here you would maybe think, and rightfully so, that the designers intended for rarity to also tell us how powerful a magic item is, and because power can probably equate to demand, at least for an adventurer. But there's an issue with this logic, and that is that the rarities we get in the Dungeon Master's Guide and also in other source books are wildly inconsistent. Now, of course, powerful is a loaded term. It's very subjective. What's powerful or valuable to you may not be to someone else and so on. But there are some cases where we can objectively say, or at least nearly objectively say, that one item does nearly the same as another item, just worse, but is still worth more. One of the best examples of this is the potion of flying versus winged boots. The potion will let you fly for one hour, one time, but is a very rare item, while the winged boots are an uncommon item that will let you fly for several hours every day. It's quite clear that in nearly all situations, you'd rather have the boots than you'd have the potion. Now there's two solutions to this as I see it. The first one is that you accept that rarity is not only meant to indicate actual rarity, but also demand and power. And you go ahead and change some of the rarities as they pop up if you feel like they're put wrongly by the designers of the game. So if you have this uh, potion of flying and the winged boots, you could make the potion of flying a rare item and the winged boots a rare item as well. Remember, potions are half price of a permanent magic items, so that would make them less valuable than the boots. Go ahead and change the rarities where you don't feel they make sense, so you can preserve this sense that rarity is not only 
just how scarce a good is, but also how big the demand for that good is. The second solution is that you completely detach rarity from value. This would mean going through and for every item individually coming up with a price and ignoring basically what the book tells you about the rarity and value of a magic item. So if you have something like the winged boots, you could determine that they'll be worth, let's say, 4,000 gold pieces, while the potion of flying can be picked up for 500 gold pieces, and you'll have solved this issue of one item clearly being better than the other while still having a higher rarity. You can still keep the rarity if you want to. Potions of flying are incredibly rare, perhaps because everyone can go around and pick up winged boots, which are clearly better, so there's not really a whole lot of reason to create potions of flying. Another issue with the way 5e determines the value of magic items is that even if you trust the rarity that you're given and you think it's the correct rarity relative to other magic items, you are still only giving a price range for magic items at each rarity. And these price ranges are very wide, going from 500 gold pieces to 5,000 gold pieces for a rare item, for example. So even if you do trust the rarity of a magic item, you'll still have to determine its final value on your own, as you're only given this price range to work with. Now you could go through the book and determine a set price for each item, and that's something that we'll do in the Wanderer's Guide to Merchants and Magic. But if you want to just quickly uh, not have to deal too much with it and have a solution that works at the table, what I suggest is that you have the high end of that range be the starting point price for a merchant. That's the absolute maximum that they think they can get for a magic item in that rarity range. Then depending on the merchant and the character's ability to haggle, they can get a discount of up to, let's say, 50%, so you'll end up in the middle of that range. As for selling magic items, I suggest that you do it the other way around, so that the initial selling price for magic item is always the lowest in the range for that rarity, but if the characters can make a good case or they can find the right buyer, they may be able to push that price up to 50% of the max value. As for how the characters should haggle and barter, that's also something that the 5e rules doesn't really cover that well. What I suggest is that you use abilities that tie to the character's intelligence and charisma. That could be investigation, persuasion, performance, deception, and allow the characters to use these ability checks to haggle and barter with the merchant. You can set a DC based on how friendly you think the merchant is and how easy it should be to, to haggle down the price, and perhaps also give characters advantage based on how much the merchant likes them or if they can come up with a good argument or good bargain. We're still playtesting more specific rules for these, but they will be present in Wanderer's Guide to Merchants and Magic when it is published. Finally, there's the whole issue of economy as a whole in D&D, &D, which is something that 5e isn't very good at making clear how much is gold actually worth. You'll have some prices in the player's handbook for mundane goods, of course. You have these price ranges for magic items in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And you also have some estimates on how much gold a character should have at a given level and how many magic items tucked away at the back of chapter one. In the end, you can put whatever price you want on your magic items. You could say this item is worth 50,000 gold or five gold pieces. It all comes down to how much a gold piece is actually worth and how many of them your players have. It's mostly a matter of picking a level of relative wealth and being consistent with. So if you want your characters to be able to buy and sell magic items, and you also want them to be able to pick up a lot of magic items, you'll of course want to give them more gold relative to how you're pricing your magic items. If you want a rule of thumb to guide by, I think that's something like what's shown on screen here would make a good fit if you're using the rarity and price ranges given in the official rules, and assuming that the characters are paying roughly the medium price for an item, so 250 for an uncommon item and 2,500 gold for a rare item and so on. Again, this is just a guideline. It all depends on how available you want magic items to be in your campaign. So in summary, the advice boils down to be ready to either change the value or the rarity of magic items, assume the highest price point in the range for magic items when the characters are buying them and the lowest when they're selling them or determine them individually if you think you are able to do that. Third, consider how much gold the characters will have access to and you want them to have access to and how that will impact how many magic items they can buy and sell on the markets and how that will influence the game. All right, so that wraps up this quick video on pricing magic items. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at magic shops and how you can run a magic shop in your game, including how you would describe such a shop, how you can prepare for an inventory, and how you can make certain that the characters don't just rob the place and run away with a dragon's hoard of magic items. I'd be hugely grateful if you'd follow Wanderer's Guide to Merchants and Magic on Kickstarter or by signing up to the newsletter in the link below. As mentioned previously, you'll get a free sample and also be notified to get 
early bird special offers when the campaign launches. Beyond that, there's nothing else to say than thank you for watching this video, and I hope that I'll see you in the next one.